The next uh, submission is an oral presentation by the Canadian Environmental Law Association as outlined CMD 15H 2.122 and 2.122A and B. And I understand that uh, Ms. McLellahan will make the presentation. Please proceed. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And thank you for giving us the opportunity to attend here today. And I'd also like to acknowledge the support of the funding program and uh, acknowledge, uh, although with me here today is Mr. Jeremy Dixon, who's an LPP program, will be uh, a lawyer in Ontario in a few months, is already a lawyer in Texas and New York. But I also had the assistance of Mr. Rizwan Khan, who's a lawyer in Ontario, who articled and then get, did contract work for CELA. Uh, and that funding program allowed me to have Mr. Khan uh, assemble documentation relevant to Kincardine emergency planning. <coughs> I would like to comment that things have changed uh, quite a bit. As you know, CELA was looking at emergency planning at the Darlington New Build, Darlington Refurbishment and Pickering hearings, and we had indicated to um, many people, uh, including representatives of Bruce Power at one of the emergency planning discussions uh, last year that we would also be looking at the emergency planning at the Bruce plant, and we've looked at all of these in the wake of the Fukushima accident to inquire into the sufficiency of emergency preparedness around the plants, particularly because this is one of the most critical issues with respect to protection of the public. And as you have heard many times, the, the goal of emergency planning is to make sure that the public is not exposed to radioactive dose in the event of an accident. And as I said to you, um, at the Pickering hearing and, and before you did the emergency planning uh, uh, regulation 210-1, uh, uh, um, it's an important part of your role and your jurisdiction to be looking at the adequacy of emergency planning. Uh, so I would urge you not only in this hearing but in, in every licensing hearing um, to look at it in detail and to look at the documents in particular and to make sure that their compliance with the provincial plan, there's a master plan of the province from 2009, um, is evident, and also with your own uh, reg doc is evident. So before, and I won't have time to go through every slide, I'll, I'll hit a few highlights in a moment, but before I do that, I might also mention that, uh, as I do note in the presentation and in my material, the current plan that's adopted by the town of Kincardine is dated to 2006. That plan uh, has an appendix, you've heard about Appendix N, which deals with emergency procedures. And we inquired uh, of Kincardine for a copy last year and this year, and were advised that it wasn't ready yet. Uh, and I made similar inquiries of Mr. Nodwell at Emergency Management Ontario this winter, um, who advised that it was um, uh, uh, being prepared. Just prior to the April 7th date, I became aware that Bruce Power had indicated um, to Greenpeace that there was detailed emergency planning, so I asked what that was. So they kindly sent me uh, documents, which included the documents I had already reviewed and was familiar with, the Kincardine emergency plan, for example. Uh, pardon me, they refer to the concurrent emergency plan, but they sent a 2015 emergency plan, but advised me that it's in draft. So I have a copy of that. It's March 2015 uh, labeled draft, and I, I have reviewed it. It's largely similar to the 2006 plan, but it doesn't include uh, a reference to an appendix, N, and the, the um, tracking document indicates that appendix N, which deals with emergency procedures, is to be removed. The 2006 plan refers to Appendix N uh, a number of times around things like setting up the evacuation centers, notification procedures, and so on. 
which is why I was asking for it all along and why it always struck me as important. The extent to which it is now um, embedded in the 2015 draft, I'm not sure, since I have very little time to really do a line-by-line -line comparison, but it strikes me that largely the 2015 draft um, is, uh, is essentially similar to the 2006 draft. <clears throat> so that's um, a concern. The one that's in place today is apparently incomplete, and the one that's um, more recent is draft. The other um, thing I was concerned about, and I noted in my report, is that Saugeen Shores uh, is identified in the provincial master plan as a host municipality. Um, so the, the primary municipality is Kincard, and then the host municipality is Saugeen Shores. And then they have certain responsibilities, I actually excerpted them right in my report, um, around things like setting up reception centres, but they also have to have a nuclear emergency response plan themselves. All I was able to find uh, was a reference that they were working on one with uh, funding from, from Bruce. In credit to them, and as I mentioned in my report, there was reference um, to nuclear emergencies, but it was buried on their websites. So I had some recommendations. I have some recommendations about putting that all in one place and making that obvious to the public. So uh, Bruce did send me uh, a Saugeen Shores emergency nuclear plan dated January 2014, but also indicated that that's draft as well. So this is the, the, the kind of concern I have. These are, these are old plants operating for decades, and it's not as though they were just commissioned last year. And it's not as though emergency planning is a new topic, and in my report I indicated to you um, the recommendations that were made uh, 20 years ago, over 20 years ago, by a cabinet committee, and I used that as a framework for some of the recommendations. That, that report from the Ontario cabinet doesn't appear to have been acted on, at least that we can see, because, for example, the, the planning basis hasn't been revised and the emergency planning zone hasn't been revised. The last thing I want to say by way of introduction, because I won't have time to go in detail through our report, is that the, um, oh, I should also mention that what I didn't know about until a couple of days ago, I, I knew that Bruce um, is planning to distribute the KI pills. They've mentioned that often. They said they've begun. Um, so Mr. Um, Saunders provided um, uh, Ms. Um, Spletsia are uh, copies of the material that's going to the community. This is the kind of thing that I think should be provided to you at hearings, um, and, sh and you should be directing the applicants and the staff to make sure that this kind of material, which is good, on the whole it's, it's quite good, um, apart from the fact that there's this odd thing where you read about all the other emergencies in the municipality, you get to your notes, you think you're done, and then there's the emergency plan, um, so I'm glad I flipped the page. Maybe it's so that it's handy at the back, because it does have the emergency um, sectors, the, the sectors for the secondary and primary at the back, which is good. It also, for the first time that I've seen anywhere, tells people that if they're in certain sectors, what's their evacuation route? This is nowhere else available on any website or any communication that I've seen before this publication. But that's important. And it also, I guess, when it's distributed, it's telling people what their sector number is or it helps them inquire. It doesn't include an element that's in both Reg Doc 2101 and uh, the PNERP 2009, which is advising people about how they will be notified or alerted in the first place that there's an emergency. So are they in an area where there are sirens? Are they in an area where there's going to be door to door? Uh, how will they know? But if they do find out that there's something going on, then they're told what radio stations to turn to. So that's good. The last thing on the um, second part of our presentation, which, um, which I won't go into detail today because it's not really for your decision today, is commentary, and I'm indebted to Mr. Dixon for this, looking at specifically how it is that we think some of the regulations are too vague. Um, I've said that at some of the previous hearings, but it details 
um, in quite a bit of detail. This will be useful to us in future reviews of your regulations, which I've heard from staff repeatedly as a continuous improvement exercise. And I especially um, point to the fact that I would submit, and I will submit in the future, that you have jurisdiction over the planning basis around the Canadian nuclear plants. I know you defer to the provinces on that. Um, we are attempting to engage with the province here on that. We think it's a big problem. Um, and I make detailed recommendations in my report about that as well. So, since I've used up almost all my time and haven't even gone to the slide deck, uh, <laughs> yes, I, I assumed when I was preparing for today that you would have read it, and when I reread it, one thing I want to say about the slide deck and the report is that I do stand behind all of the commentary in the report and the slide deck, even in view of the most recent material I was provided with last week and in view of everything I've heard today. It all still does, in my opinion, stand up. I'd be very happy to engage in any um, back and forth with, uh, with you on that as well. So, um, the last thing I want to say, because it has had little attention, is that on slide, uh, very back of the slide deck, we talk about uh, recommending that the reactors not be approved to run past the 210,000 um, extended or uh, uh, full power hours that the reactors were originally designed to and that's been the point at which refurbishment has been considered in the past and the recommendation of the staff is to, to go to 247,000 full power hours and we would ask that you not license the plant beyond the 210,000 full power hours without a full hearing on refurbishment. Thank you.